I think this is the last one. So we want to talk about examining ourselves, which is generally not a topic people are eager to do. Um, but I think we want, first of all, to think clearly about what does it look like to manifest the character of God, to be in the flesh something that carries his love, his patience, his truth, but also his vulnerability. We've talked about some of that. We've certainly talked about vulnerability and systems. We have considered God's call to his people, and we have built, uh, and the systems that we have built in his name that are to carry, carry his character as well. And we have also looked at the fact that, sadly, such systems often do not look like him at all. And I want to give you just a way to think about what it means, really, in a human term, to have a system that looks like Christ. My father was a colonel in the US Air Force. He was a graduate of VMI and the war broke out, and he was sent for flight training, and then he was sent to North Africa, where he got uh, very ill with encephalitis, and they thought he was going to die. So they put him on a big plane and sent him to London and had his best friend go with him in case he did die. Obviously, he didn't. He went on to continue in the war. He was in the lead plane over Normandy, dropping paratroopers. And he received the Distinguished Flying Cross for Operation Market Garden, which many of you have seen a bridge too far. That's what that was about. Something began <clears throat> happening to him physically that nobody could understand or name. And eventually, he had to retire at age 42 because of some neurological problem, disease that nobody could name. And so we left all that I had ever known and became members of the civilian life. They think that it was probably due to the case of encephalitis that he had in North Africa. He was a, a very bright man. He was a gentleman in all the right ways that that word communicates that. He was superb with words, and he was an outstanding athlete. I watched, my family watched his deterioration for 30 years. He died at 72. I learned many lessons watching him deteriorate. He became a man who couldn't tie his shoes, couldn't pour a glass of milk, couldn't get himself out of a chair. And I watched him struggle, and I watched him persist at continuing to be a gentleman and uh, care for other people in the way that he handled his disease. But I didn't realize until years later, and I was doing the work that I do, that I learned a major lesson from my father's life, along with many other lessons. But in watching him deteriorate, what I learned was a body that does not follow its head is a very, very sick body. And that is a picture of what happens in so-called Christian systems. They have deteriorated to the point that they don't follow their head. They aren't connected to their head. They don't listen to the instructions that their head tells them. And I think that you are aware that there have been <clears throat> many such illustrations of that in recent years. And I think I have said earlier today, uh, this week that you will see more. 
So we're part of this body. And part of what that means is that our, <clears throat> our first purpose is to know our head and to follow our head so that the actions of the body of our head look like him, not like something that doesn't make sense, that doesn't fit with who he is. So that means he's light and truth. That means who we are individually and collectively needs to be light and truth. He's love. And where we compromise these things in our systems and in our personal lives, we are failing to follow our head and we look nothing like him. And we are then a very sick body. Now I want you to hear some words from the prophet Ezekiel who is actually talking to us about a sick body that doesn't follow its head. It's from Ezekiel 34. The Lord spoke to me, son of man, he said, you must prophesy against the shepherds of Israel and say to them, this is what the Lord God says, I am angry with the shepherds of Israel. They only think about themselves, but shepherds should keep the sheep safe and well. You eat their milk and make warm clothes from their wool. You kill the best animals to eat. You have not kept my sheep well and safe. You have not helped the weak sheep to grow strong. You have not made the sick ones well, nor have you tied up those who were hurting. You have not found the lost sheep and brought them back. You have not ruled them in a kind way. You have been cruel to them. So my sheep have gone away to many places because they did not have a shepherd. Then the wild animals ate them and my sheep went over the mountains and the high hills and they were all over the land and nobody went to find them. I say this to you, my shepherds, says the Lord. My sheep do not have any shepherds. Your shepherds have not kept my sheep safe and wild animals have eaten them. You did not look out for those that were lost. You only wanted good for yourselves. So I want you to think about that as, we, as you reflect back on what we talked about in terms of systemic violence. I want you to think about it in terms of your own choices, that any choice that you make in ministry to feed yourself is a choice against your head and will lead you to look nothing like him. And not only will you not look like him, you will do damage to his sheep, the ones he has entrusted to you. So a shepherd does not do these things, a true shepherd. A true shepherd looks like Jesus Christ. At home, in places where no one's looking, on the street, behind a pulpit, wherever he goes, a shepherd looks like Jesus Christ. So I want with that, just as a beginning, to think about what it means for you and I to look at ourselves and whether we are like him following our head or not. And I think I mentioned earlier this week that it has long been a habit of mine that when I'm going to speak on a particular topic, I do a word study. So my first step was, of course, to examine the word examine. <laughs> it's actually a very old word. It's centuries old. And it means to inspect in detail, to determine the condition of something. It means to look closely and carefully in order to learn more about something or to find out where the problems or kinks might be. You and I often examine things before we buy them, particularly if they have been used or if they are very expensive. We want to make sure we're getting what we paid for. Other synonyms are scrutinize, investigate, delve in, weigh, or probe. Now, think for a minute about someone doing that to you. 
And if you're honest, you'll say it immediately would make you uncomfortable. Somebody coming along and investigating you, scrutinizing you no matter where you are, delving into your life, and not only your life, but your thoughts, probing. We have a little bit, a little taste of this discomfort when we go to a doctor's office because we need an examination. It's a vulnerable and exposing place. I've never met anybody who liked it. Everybody wants to avoid such things if they can. We do not want the doctor to examine, and we do not want them to find anything wrong or broken. We also feel anxious about it when we're being tested on a subject in school. You've all been students, so you wouldn't be sitting here. So you know what that's like to have somebody scrutinize your knowledge and ability in a certain subject with an exam. We're also uh, nervous about examinations. If we've done or been involved in something that wasn't good, and we get, in essence, called to the principal's office in some form and told to exp ask to explain ourselves. We're, whenever we are to be examined about uh, ourselves or an event we've been in, the automatic first response of humans is that we start sifting through what we will say and what we will leave out and what we will misstate. Being examined is frightening. We might fall short. We feel anxious. We feel anxious when we have to take a test. We have a job evaluation. Criticism from our spouse. Or again, a friend or a doctor's verdict. We feel small, less than, devalued, and often afraid. And such vulnerability can easily lead us to overvalue ourselves or excuse ourselves out of self-protection. To do that, sometimes we examine the examiner, and we find them wanting. So if there's a problem in the examination, it is, of course, the fault of the examiner. Assessments are also fertile ground for self-deception. Again, to be examined is to be vulnerable, and sometimes it's a frightening place for us. Yet it is an action that we are called to by our God. A refusal to examine ourselves is a refusal to be his obedient servant. So how do we approach this most unwanted and uncomfortable call of God? One that you and I prefer to avoid. One where we prefer to engage in very heavy doses of self-deceit. And sometimes one we think will crush us if we have to stand in his light. You and I are his children. He loves his children. But that love also calls us to the light. So it's a bit of a dilemma, you see, because light is a frightening place. But that's where he wants to meet those he loves. What that means, though, is that with we get examined with his light, but we are never examined without his love. Let that sink in. You will never stand in God's light without the presence of his love. There is no such place. He will accompany us to that place. He knocks and says, let's examine you. Let's search your heart and mind together. And he longs for us to respond as David did in Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting and you know my rising. You understand my thoughts from afar. You are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know all. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Even the darkness is not dark to you. You think about Isaiah's response to standing in the light in chapter 6, where it says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. If that doesn't make you want to hide, you're not paying attention. It makes me want to run. 
is exactly what Adam and Eve did. They ran. Isaiah said the foundations of the earth trembled at the sound of God's voice. It's a really scary place. And Isaiah said, woe is me. I'm ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. Sounds like a disaster, doesn't it? But then the seraphim comes with the burning coal and touched Isaiah's mouth and said, this has touched your mouth. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. The presence of God's love was demonstrated. And again, that's a very familiar verse, but you think about it for a minute. He didn't say just your sin is forgiven. He said your iniquity is taken away. You see, whether we live in the light or not, we live in the light. The question is whether we will pay attention to it, realize it's there, think about it. So we can either look with him in the light, or we can refuse to look. But our refusal to look does not undo his seeing. He sees no matter whether you want to look or not. Given our capacity for self-deception, we often seem to refuse to look and think what our God sees. He always sees, he always waits, and he always waits with his light and with his love. It's very interesting to think that God calls us, deceitful creatures that we are, to examine ourselves. I mean, to me, that sounds a little bit ridiculous. That's like telling a blind person to go to the mirror and tell me what they see. They can't. A deceived person, which we all are, really can't see him or herself clearly. It can only happen when God is waiting there for us. And he always waits there with light and his love. So you think about it, deceit ruined God's earth. It ruined the creatures that he had lovingly created. His image bearers were ruined by a master deceiver, and in many ways they became like that deceiver rather than like the God who created them. Yet God says to those image bearers, examine yourselves. Again, it seems like it would be a hopeless exercise, and it would be were it not an invitation. The call to examine ourselves again is a call to him. It is a call to the light of the world, which is terrifying. But he who is the light is the lover of your soul. He does not look at us. He does not ask us to look at ourselves alone, ever. We cannot, because we're deceived. We need him there. We can't see clearly, and again, we don't want to. The call to examine yourselves is a call to a duet. It's a duet sung by you and the Father. The Father who is understood in the life of the Word made flesh, who relentlessly followed his head while here on earth. That word is truth and light and infinite love and kindness and unerring obedience to the Father. Jesus never deviated. He is the one who enables us to see where we are blind, to put the right labels on things and call them by their right name. Many, many years ago when I was probably four, or so, maybe five, and my brother was two. We lived in Washington, D.C., and we went to a huge store. And some of you are not old enough to remember this, but they used to put stuff out on these big wooden squares, and they would pile ch shirts and all kinds of things. And underneath were these little plastic tags, and it would say, shirt, $2, whatever. And my brother disappeared for a while in the store until my mother realized it and we all went out looking for him and found him and he came back to my mother and his pockets were like this <laughs> and his pockets were full of the little plastic tags that told everybody what each item was in a very large store so the labels were all wrong they were actually gone and the poor people who worked there had to put them back but that's what we do inside 
We want to remove the labels from things. We don't want anybody to see what we really are like. And so we stuff our pockets and think we've got it covered. I suppose in some ways we look as silly to God as my brother did to the rest of us. So how are we going to do this? It's kind of complicated sounding. How in God's presence do we examine ourselves? Well, we might start quite simply by simply getting quiet and alone with him and saying, God, in fear and trembling, show me myself. Let me see me from your viewpoint. And in showing me, teach me how to be more like you. So I want to see me the way you see me. But I want it to be a start of becoming more like you. The search for truth is in those words, and so is hope. We're asking for truth from the God of all truth, and we're asking for Christ-likeness as a result. I suspect in response, he will show us ourselves as we go through our days. He will expose us to ourselves. He will expose us by way of other people. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, he's showing you yourself. <laughs> Remember, what comes out of you comes from your heart, not from the stupid driver who just did that. <laughs> he will expose us to ourselves. Think about Judas for a minute. He was offered ample opportunity when Jesus was here to see himself, and he repeatedly refused to do so. And the result was the death of our Lord. How? The scriptures tell us Judas was a thief and he had the bag. I puzzled over that for years. Why would you do that? If I had a group of people following me around and I knew one of them was a thief, I would not put them in charge of the money. I mean, that just seems logical to me. If you were involved in a new enterprise, you would not give the funds you have collected for it to a known thief. But Jesus did. In John 12, we're told that Jesus and his disciples were in Bethany shortly after Lazarus was raised. Judas was a thief. He carried the money bag, and he used it to pilfer whatever was put in there. Again, why would he do this? Why would Jesus let him do this? Not only did he do it, he did it in the presence of Jesus himself. I mean, that's really quite stunning. It's audacious, actually. Every time money was put in the bag, it was an invitation to Judas from God himself to examine himself, to see himself and what he was doing, and to choose God. That's why. Jesus gave him the money bag to expose Judas to Judas and invite him to repentance. Instead, Judas perpetually hardened himself and deceived himself until the day when he utterly betrayed our Lord and actually thought he was doing a good thing. That's how twisted he got. His deception ran very deep. He did not examine himself. He deceived himself and the other disciples. And recall that at the Last Supper, nobody could guess who was going to betray Jesus. It was not obvious. It was, they were, it was indistinguishable. They'd look around the table and say, is it, is it I, Lord? Yet one among them had continually to do it repeatedly. It's a very sobering picture. To repeatedly refuse to look at ourselves and face our disobedience to our God over and over is to be like Judas and to betray our Lord and to some degree put out the light that he has been shining on us, inviting us to look at ourselves. You think about the recent and ongoing exposures in Christendom. Leaders being exposed about years of deception, all the while appearing to walk with Jesus. We learn as the story unfolds, that there have long been signs, actions, and troubling behaviors. Those have even been noted by others, but they were excused and, and denied for the sake of the work. 
Those exposures are like Judas and the money bag. Those exposures that came along little by little were like Jesus giving him the money bag. And those who eventually got fully disclosed refused the invitation. If we accept the invitation, we will find God in that place. The place we're most afraid of, the place we have most shame about, he will meet us there. And again, his exposures are always out of love. Because what Jesus knew was that rather than choosing him, Judas would be choosing his own death, not just physically, but spiritually. And he loved him. He wanted him to step in the light. Jesus is reaching for us when we choose blindness. He knows we are drinking poison in the way we excuse ourselves. We are cloaked in darkness, and he longs for us to turn on his light and love and calls us to examine ourselves in his light beside him and listen to his questions and his probing and bow down before him in truth and repentance. He longs for us to return home to him. I also believe we're not just to examine ourselves. Our God would have us hear from others about ourselves. Sometimes that's really more scary than looking at yourself, isn't it? What would our spouses or our children or our friends or co-workers or those who serve us tell us about us? a little scary. Amy Carmichael once said, a cup full of sweetness cannot spill even one drop of bitter water, no matter how suddenly jolted. Go back to the bad driver cutting you off. What that will do is expose what's in your cup. It is reminiscent, again, of the words of Jesus. What comes out of a person comes from the heart of the person. We need to hear from those who receive what comes out of us. Because we tend to whitewash that. So you ask yourself, where is it that I'm short with people? In what circumstances? Or with what particular people? Where am I critical of others? Where am I impatient? Where am I slow to respond or ignoring others? Those attitudes are not present because others have failed me, even if they have. Those responses tell me what is in my heart and what was there when it got bumped from others and it is now exposed and I have a choice before God. So listen to how you respond to yourself. Do you say things well? I did that because I was tired. I did that because I really had a, a bad day. I did that because I was hungry. Or do we recognize that we did that, whatever that is, because it was in our heart to do so? And in case you haven't figured it out yet, this examine thing can be quite painful. Here are some questions you might ask as you take time to look at yourself before God. What did I learn growing up about vulnerability? How was I taught, both by word and by deed, about how to care for the vulnerable? What did I learn about empathy, about relationships and how to maneuver them? What is it like for someone else to confront me? Have I ever asked them? Have I ever asked anyone? What did I witness at home growing up? Respect, kindness, rage, labeling, humiliation, silence, compassion, shame? Where am I more like my human inheritance and not like my Lord? You have two inheritances. What is it like for your family to receive you at home? Have I ever asked my spouse or those with whom I work how they experience me when we discuss things, when we disagree or argue about something, when we encounter difficulties, 
disappointment or disagree? How do I treat others when I'm stressed? When am I anxious? When am I angry? When am I hurt? What are the things in my life that I'm hiding from those around me? Where do I excuse behaviors to myself or to others? What are those things I tell myself repeatedly, well, that's okay because, and yet no, it is not. Where do I say to myself, okay, I, I, I need to stop this. I understand I need to stop. I'm just, I'll just do this one more time, and then I'll stop. How do you talk to yourself about yourself? How do you talk to yourself about others? Those important to you and those who are not so important to you. Do you focus your intention and wiggle out of facing your impact? They are not always the same. What spills out of the cup of your character when you are confronted or threatened? Anger, demeaning remarks, unkindness, bullying, shutting down, silent treatment. Jesus says, whatever comes out of you, your impulses, your thoughts, your words, your choices, exposes who you are. What have the bumps or jarring of others exposed in you? When someone bumps our cup, the hand of God is always behind it, exposing us to ourselves. That's what he did with Judas. One of the important lessons my work with trauma victims has taught me is that God is ever and always working both sides. It took me a few years to figure that one out. I thought people were coming to me for help which they were, but God sent them to me because I needed help too. I must often restrain myself because someone in my room is terrified. I must wait in long silences for another to find words they've never spoken before and then finally speak them. I must hear stories of evil that I did not know existed, couldn't have made up if I tried, and frankly still do not want in my head. Many decades ago, a pastor's wife brought a woman to see me. The pastor's wife knew the woman was extremely troubled, and she didn't understand why, and she couldn't get her to speak. She would come to church late and sit in the back row and leave early. And the pastor's wife, who was a lovely, gracious woman, pursued her and tried to get her to just even say hello, and she would, she, she would get a look of terror and flee. And so one day she asked her if she would come and see some, some lady she knew who might be able to help her. And for some strange reason, which I'm sure has to do with God, this young woman agreed. She came to see me, and I was in my early 20s. I had a master's degree and I was starting my doctorate. Trauma was not yet a, an acknowledged diagnostic category. So I started working with trauma victims and Vietnam vets with nothing to call them diagnostically. But I greeted her in the waiting room. The pastor's wife had brought her. It was obvious that she was terrified and we walked back to my office. Usually I put my hand out and the client goes in first. She froze, shook her head and pointed to me. No words. So I said, you want me to go in first? So she did. So I did. And I did that every week with her. Because if I went in first, I couldn't come up behind her. I didn't know that at the time, of course. So we sat down, and I did what I did. I said some things, and I asked some questions. Dead silence. I tried all sorts of things to get her to speak. <laughs> Nothing happened. She curled up in a fetal position on the chair that she sat in, looked down at the rug, wrapped her arms around her legs, and her whole body shook all the time. I quit talking. 
I ran out of ideas. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I felt like a failure. I wanted, to, wanted her to speak so I would not feel like that. I felt useless. I felt like a stupid young clinician who didn't know anything about what she was doing, which was partially true. <laughs> I felt inferior. Surely some senior therapist could sweep in and magically make this woman talk. She came every week. She started driving herself. She would sit in the waiting room. I would follow her into the office. She would curl up in a fetal position and shake for an hour, and then she would leave. She did not speak. This went on for months. I finally decided to wonder out loud if I could ask her a few questions. Can I ask you two or three questions? And you don't have to say anything. But do you think you could either nod yes or no? And she nodded yes. I said, I think you're afraid, yes? Of me? <laughs> of everybody? Yes. All answers nodded, yes. And then I said, have you ever met somebody you weren't afraid of? And she went like this. That's my first no from her. She sat in utter silence with me for six months. And then she opened her mouth one day and actually said a whole sentence. Turned out she was a very bright woman. She was my teacher. I had it backwards. I didn't know that at first, of course, but I later learned it was the first time in her life she had ever sat in a closed room with another human being and felt safe. She'd never tasted it before. She stayed because she longed for that sense of safety. She would come once a week to soak that in. And as long as she didn't talk, she thought she protected it because she was sure if she said anything, I would get upset with her and that would be the end of it. She came in weekly to drink in silent safety. She assumed I would get angry. She assumed I, I would tell her she had to talk or leave. It had happened to her before when she tried. She assumed if she did speak, I would get angry and tell her not to bother to come back. She was sure I would not believe what she had to tell me. I chose to let her be my teacher about life and about herself and about what she needed from me in response. Nothing ever prepared me for such an encounter. I learned that the day that she was brought home from the hospital, her father put his cigarettes out on her heels because she was a girl and not a boy. She still had the scars. She was beaten mercilessly. She doesn't remember ever not being beaten. She was forbidden to eat at the table because she was not worthy or human. He fed her in a bowl on the floor with his dogs. He raped her as far back as she could remember. And he brought his friends into the house so they could do the same. And then they would literally throw her down the basement in the dark and leave her there. He trafficked her. That was not a word back then for years. She went to the public school, because the law required it, never spoke there. She learned a lot, but nobody knew it, because she never spoke. But after school, he would pick her up at the end of the year and take her to a place in the country, in a big barn, where a system was operating where they trafficked her all summer. And he would come back in the fall, and they would come and get her to go home, and she would watch her father get out of the car and do this to receive his money. Her mother knew. All of my work over these decades now bears the fruit of her courage. Her speaking the truth about her life, her teaching me things I had no idea had ever existed nor do I think my professors or supervisors did. Her life changed dramatically 
though she was always scarred. She's in heaven now, and she has seen the one who bore her scars, both internal and external, and she no longer has any. But her lessons remain, and she is still my teacher. Her life taught me things that have touched every single trauma victim I have ever encountered. Her presence in my life forced me to examine myself. Why do you want her to do X, Y, and Z? Who is that for? You want her to speak so you can say you got her to talk? That's feeding off of her. That's in the same category of everything else that's ever happened to her. My fruit is hers. Her lessons are embodied in what I teach about trauma. And God used her to teach me and change me and impact many others, victims and therapists. And he is using your work and your family and the hard places in your life and the disappointments and the failures partly to expose you to yourself, to bring his light and love and life more deeply into your soul so that you will bear his fragrance wherever you go. Listen, to examine ourselves, to ask others for input about us, to hear from our Father in heaven about what he sees is frankly frightening. I never met anybody who really was looking forward to it. It's also a gift. He has redeemed us so that we might be like him, and exposure is terrifying. It was for the woman in my office, but her exposure exposed me. We are all hiders. We have been so since Eden. Sadly, we hide from the Lord of love. To hide is to choose lies. To hide is to choose death. To examine ourselves and be exposed is to be like him. He was utterly exposed. And he was forsaken by God in that exposure so you would never be forsaken in yours. If you stand in the light, you will find love. They cannot be separated. If you avoid the light, you will miss him. What's your bag? What has God given to you, brought into your life to help you see more clearly? May we not be like Judas. The light was rejected by him. He deceived himself over, the, over and over again, and it led to death. Not only his, but our Lord's. May we face the light knowing that he who is light calls us to that light so that we might clearly see and become like him. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any way in me that is unlike you, that grieves you, that does not carry your fragrance out into this world. Use that exposure so that my life bears your fragrance as the Rose of Sharon into a ruined life on a ruined planet for your glory. Now there was a poem that I was gonna close with actually, but I don't think I brought it with me here. I mean, I, it's probably in the room. Anyway. I just want to tell you something that is in it and have you go read it yourselves. Let me just check and see. So it's a wonderful, wonderful poem. It's a poem by um, George Herbert. And it's called The Bag. And it talks about Jesus coming down to earth and discarding all the beautiful things about himself in order to just become a human and how he put things aside. He gave something to the sun and something to the stars and all of that that were his characters, characteristics. But there's a place in it where he talks about being ready to leave the earth. He's on the cross. And when the spear went into his side, and what Herbert does there is so stunning because what he says is, Jesus has a bag. 
it's here. And Jesus in the poem invites us to take the stuff out of our bags and put them in his, where they will be received with love, where they will be transformed. And he says, I'll be in heaven basically, but that's what you need to keep doing, putting your things in my bag and I will take them to the Father, always. So I would encourage you to learn more about the bag that rests in his body and hide things there because they will never damage you if you put them there. And the last line of the poem, he says, away despair, away. Because I've worked with people long enough to know that people, people in leadership, often have things they hide and they work hard to hide them from themselves as much as other people. And God longs for exposure and light because that's who he is. And eventually something happens to shine light on them. And often it makes a really big mess. Don't wait for that. Don't wait for that. There's a bag and it's not yours to carry. It's been borne by your Lord. And for all your work with people and in God's church and your blessing of them and your comforting them and your teaching them, he's there for you as you are there for others. And he wants you to know how much he loves you. And part of the way he does that is to require that you become more like him because that's the only safe place to be. So go to your Lord. He has the bag now, not Judas. Thank you. I actually have the poem here. Oh, not only that, you if, put it in bigger font. And I put it in bigger font. If there, there's no rush, if it sounds like it would be powerful for you to I, read this for us, so well, let me. I, uh, first of all, I just like reading it so selfishly. Absolutely. <laughs> is, is that work? And all I have to do is just scroll like that, and it should work well. Yeah, and the whole thing is there with the last line at the bottom. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> I grew up with an English teaching grandmother who always read poetry to me, so I have a love for it. Away, despair. My gracious Lord doth hear, though winds and waves assault my keel. He doth preserve it, he doth steer, even when the boat seems most to reel. Storms are the triumphs of his art. Well may he close his eyes, but not his heart. Hast thou not heard that my Lord Jesus died? Then let me tell thee a strange story. The God of power, he did ride in his majestic robes of glory, resolved to light, and so one day he did descend, undressing all the way. The stars his tire of light and rings obtained, the cloud his bow, the fire his spear, the sky his azure mantle gained. And when they asked what he would wear, he smiled and said, as he did go, he had new clothing a-making here below. When he was come, as travelers are wont, he did repair unto an inn. But then, and after many a brunt, he did endure to cancel sin. And having given the rest before, here he gave up his life to pay our score. But as he was returning, there came one that ran upon him with a spear he who came hither all alone, bringing nor man, nor arms, nor fear, received the blow upon his side, and straight he turned unto his brethren cried, If you have anything to send or write, I have no bag, but here is room. Unto my father's hands and sight, believe me, it shall safely come that I shall mind what you impart. Look, you may put it very near my heart. 
or if hereafter any of my friends will use me in this kind, the door shall still be open. He's talking about us here. What he sends I will present, and somewhat more, not to his hurt. Sighs will convey anything to me, hark despair away. 